Now it's my great honor and privilege to introduce our 2019 convocation speaker, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, Monica Burrell. Dr. Burrell, yes, that deserves applause. <laughs> Dr. Burrell began her role as commissioner in 2015 and serves as the Commonwealth's chief, chief physician. Dr. Burrell has been an advocate for effective health policies, including raising the age for tobacco and e-cigarette sales to 21 and passing new regulations for testing blood lead levels in young children. She has led the transformation of community health investment and spearheaded creation of the, of the public health data warehouse a unique state-of-the-art tool involving multiple linked data sets across state government, which has proven invaluable in helping combat the opioid epidemic. Dr. Burrell has a long and proven history in healthcare, education, and public health. She practiced general internal medicine for more than 20 years at Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston Medical Center, neighborhood health centers, nonprofit organizations, and at the Veterans Administration. She served on the faculty of Boston University Medical School, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard School of Public Health, and has been recognized for her passionate dedication to underserved and vulnerable populations. Prior to joining DPH, she served as the Chief Medical Officer of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, the largest nonprofit organization for homeless individuals in the country. Dr. Burrell receives her received her Master of Public Health through the Commonwealth Fund Harvard University Fellowship in Minority Health Policy. She earned her medical degree from Boston University School of Medicine and completed a residency and chief residency in internal medicine at Boston City Hospital, Boston Medical Center. Commissioner Burrell. Thank you for that introduction. Dean Moore, graduates, family, faculty, and guests, thank you for inviting me to share a few thoughts with you here this morning. Graduates, congratulations on your accomplishments today. I know that you put great energy and hard work into being here today. I also know that, like me, you didn't get here alone. And today, you're surrounded by the support from your professors, your family, and your friends. Please join me in thanking your school faculty, mentors, and advisors for your exceptional education and the time and effort they put into being here with you today. And now, a special thank you to your families and friends who believed in you, even at times when you weren't sure you believed in yourselves. They helped you reach your goals, and they surround you here today. Thank you to the families and friends here. I'm so pleased to be here today with you to honor your hard work and achievement, and also to recognize you as the next generation of healthcare professionals, doers, thinkers, and leaders. And I'm thrilled to be back at BU, where I did my undergraduate medical school and residency training. That deserves an applause. BU, come on. As an undergrad at BU, I remember clearly being where you are today, wondering where my path would lead me and how I would have the greatest impact on people. I wasn't sure of those answers, and I surely didn't know I would be standing here in front of you today. However, just as I suspect is true for you, I did know that I had a calling to help others. You could have used your talents in many different areas, but you chose to keep a focus on keeping people healthy and making a difference in healthcare. And I'm so thankful to be here today with you to welcome you into this wonderful field. Getting your degree in Boston, Massachusetts is particularly special because 
you may not know, but the school that you're going to is in the state that is ranked the number two healthiest state in the country. Everyone always asks me who beat us. It's Hawaii. <laughs> but that high health ranking here in Massachusetts is not by accident. It comes from a deliberate focus on access to dedicated, high-quality health professionals and decades of smart health policy. And it comes from us collectively demanding health opportunities in our communities and from our healthcare systems. And this success can be seen every day with our health outcomes here in Massachusetts. Let me give you some examples. We have consistently seen a decrease in chronic health conditions here in Massachusetts, such as heart disease and cancer. Our efforts to re reduce smoking have been a key factor in reducing chronic illness. Having near universal health insurance also plays a role, as does low rates of injuries and obesity. We have high rates of vaccination. In fact, students in kindergarten through 12th grade are required to be immunized in Massachusetts. Here in Massachusetts, the average life expectancies of our residents is rising, bucking an unfortunate national trend of declines in life expectancy. We would likely, by the way, see higher rates of life expectancy here in Massachusetts if we weren't losing so many people due to the opiate epidemic and if there were greater social and economic opportunities for our communities of color. Our state has led the way in prevention as well, from smallpox and cholera then, to HIV, the opiate epidemic, and other public health issues, such as tobacco and e-cigarettes today. So it's true that Massachusetts has led the way when it comes to keeping people healthy and improving health and health care. And we were doing it long before many others. At the Department of Public Health this year, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary. It's an important milestone, and it's given us a chance to look back on our landmark public health achievements in this state. For example, it's pretty remarkable to learn that our first health director in Massachusetts was none other than Paul Revere. That's pretty cool, right, to follow in the footsteps of Paul Revere? I'm not sure he would have expected me to, I'm not sure he would have expected me to follow him, but here I am. And someone might not be expecting you either, but I am confident you too can lead the way in whatever way you choose to impact health moving forward. So you're not only graduating today from BU, you're continuing a strong and proud tradition of leadership and health that goes back to colonial times. But before you come up to receive your diplomas and take the next step to begin to build your career in health, I have three ideas I'd like to share with you today. Ideas that have shaped my work as a physician, ideas that have stayed with me through my public health career, and ideas that guide my work every day as Commissioner of Public Health. So to begin with the first idea, and this is profoundly simple and yet challenging to obtain. Health is a right, not a privilege. As I explained to you, we're doing well health-wise in Massachusetts. And while here in the Commonwealth, we understand health as a human right, we are, as a state and a country, a place where from birth to death, the circumstances of our lives drastically impact our health. Whether you're born and raised in Lincoln, Massachusetts, or Lincoln, Arkansas, the town and neighborhood you live in the school you go to, your parents' health. All of these things dramatically influence whether you'll develop asthma or diabetes, heart disease, or whether you'll die young. More than any other factor, our ability to live healthy is tied to our zip code. In the United States, zip code impacts our lives more than any other factor and that is unacceptable. When the American public health movement was born in Massachusetts, experts were, for the first time, 
making the connection between poor sanitation and disease. Poor sanitation and disease. This is something we now take for granted. I'm looking forward to a time when we take for granted that everyone has access to the health services that they need. When zip code no longer is the strongest predictor of how well or how long any of us live. If we can do this anywhere, we can and should be able to do it here in Massachusetts. Health is a right for all, not a privilege for some. A quick example. When I was in medical school here at Boston University, I had a patient with severe diabetes, who I still remember today. He often came in because his medications were lost or stolen, or he had related medical complications that we were struggling to address. We were well-trained on how to deal with his medical issues, but we were less well-trained on how to address the reality of his situation. He was homeless and living in the shelters and streets of Boston. He had a lot of questions that I couldn't answer. How should he store his medications while sleeping under the bridge? How could he obtain the appropriate food that he need, knew he needed for his diabetes? And how could he keep track and get to his appointments? This patient had a right to good health, just like you and I do. He reinforces for me the idea that health is a right and not a privilege. And if you remember anything from what I'm saying today, I urge you that it be this. Health inequities threaten the physical and economic health of our families and our communities. This will remain so until we, as health professionals, address them head on. Because our clinical interventions alone are not enough to provide true access to health that we all need and deserve. So again, idea number one, health is not a privilege for some, health is a right for all. And I strongly believe that as health professionals, we have a responsibility to ensure that we don't inadvertently widen the inequities that exist throughout our healthcare system. I urge you graduates to be active and engaged in the care of your patients and your clients, both in the exam room, but also outside of the exam room. The second idea I want to leave with you today is the importance of data and evidence. At the Department of Public Health, I talk frequently about pursuing what I call precision public health. And this is a model predicated on using data and evidence to address a particular population's specific needs and targeting those with the laser focus. Like you, I know the importance of clinical me measures, blood pressure, exercise, cholesterol levels, and so on. As health professionals, we enable people of all ages to live life to its fullest by helping them to promote health and to prevent or live better with injury, illness, or disability. But how we do that best is with evidence-based therapies and interventions and data that helps us to pinpoint solutions. Whether we're helping children with disabilities to participate fully in school, or helping people recover from an injury to regain their skills, or assisting people with substance use disorder or mental illness. I believe that the future of health will be about taking a sizable leap forward in how we collect, analyze, and share data and turn that data into useful information on both a personal and population scale. We need to make use of data to better understand the determinants of health, like housing, nutrition, and access to health opportunities. I'm excited that we've been able to begin to use these tools at the Department of Public Health to address important current issues, relevant issues in public health today, like the current opiate epidemic. Data and evidence-based practice deeply rooted in science is what will continue to move us forward. We need to be sure we address all of our patients' basic resource needs beyond treating a disease. This will result in enhanced healthcare quality and lower healthcare costs with the right focus on overall health and the social determinants of health. This won't be easy. And as you begin to explore these during your healthcare professions, you may be told to stay in your lane. But don't give up. Be brave on behalf of your patients and clients. Be brave in using the power of data and your and their compelling stories to advocate and further health opportunities for all of us. 
So my second idea, data must be at the forefront of leading us to better, more targeted care of our clients and patients. And that brings me to my third and final idea, the power of relationships, the power of connecting with those we care for. The power of relationships is the single most important and rewarding aspect of any profession in healthcare. I've seen firsthand the importance of these relationships. While I come to you today as the Commissioner of Public Health, I've spent 20 years working at the crossroads of medicine and public health and have, feel pri and have felt privileged to work with individuals living in some of the most vulnerable situations. Their stories are what drive me, and I believe many of you, to the work of caring for others. A community health worker who I worked with is a good example of the power of relationships. She was able to assist a patient I had known for years and help him find housing and reduce his use of alcohol. My patient went from being a regular emergency department visitor to visiting me in clinic and the emergency room only a few times a year. When I asked him what had changed, he told me simply, Doctor, you're nice and all, and you're trying to help me. But the community health worker, she really gets me. So I encourage you to forge these relationships with the people you care for. Would your patients and clients say that you get them? So many of the people you will come to care for need to be motivated to make a change in their diet, in their exercise regimen, in their daily activities. How are you going to motivate them? How will you understand obstacles they face that may be beyond their control? It begins with a relationship, with a connection. That personal touch and having the strength to use team members to get better outcomes. Yes, we need healthcare systems to address patient needs, but we also need caring, compassionate people committed to addressing these. So this is my third idea for you this morning. Beyond treating a disease or a condition or an injury, it's the power of relationships that will make the biggest difference and provide the best outcomes. We need to be good listeners. We need to make personal connections. We came into this work of improving health for people. I hope that we all remember to make our relationships a center point of all that we do. So as I conclude, I'm honored and humbled to be here with you today as the state's chief physician. And the work I do now at the department is informed tremendously by the people I met as patients and the relationships that I developed. Their stories stay with me, and I believe will stay with you as you progress in your careers in health, whatever those careers may be. So the last story I want to share with you comes from one morning during my years in clinic at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program, where I met a patient I'll call Michael. During that first visit, the nurse in the room pulled out about 20 different medications that revealed Michael's long list of complicated medical problems. Michael was in his 70s, in his 70s, and he was homeless, sleeping in boxes near Boston Harbor. As I got to know him, he shared with me that while he didn't trust the government, he had served in the armed forces and was a military veteran. His visits to the clinic were unpredictable. Sometimes he made it in, sometimes he didn't. Case managers and sister agencies that helped with housing found Michael a place to stay. Maybe surprising to everyone except him, even when housed, he returned from time to time to those boxes at Boston Harbor. And then one day, like too many people in his situation, Michael stopped coming to clinic. When I heard he had passed away, I sat for a moment and cried. I added his memory to the many other patients I missed and used the gift of his connection and presence to strengthen my fortitude for our work in healthcare that we are all so passionate about. I honor Michael and people like him in doing the work that I do 
to improve our healthcare system and our health system to allow people to navigate it, both the healthcare and social service systems effectively. This takes time, energy, and patience as we build trust and understanding. It also takes collaboration and teamwork, working together. As you look around at your fellow graduates, your friends, your colleagues, you're also looking at the future of healthcare and health sciences, and you will surely come to rely on each other deeply. And so, whether you go to work in a clinical sphere, in physical or behavioral health, in nutrition, or therapy or rehabilitation, in policy, in research, in government, as leaders in health professions. I ask you to, the, to approach the care you provide with passion, with energy, with enthusiasm. Be bold and brave on behalf of those you care for, especially those without the strength of their own voice. You will no doubt bring new ideas, techniques, technologies, to benefit patients and clients in the future. You are the future. Graduates, the health of the world is in your hands. Thank you for choosing a career of service. Best wishes and congratulations.